Hey, Mark, this is Zach. It's trying out the test. Hey, Zach, thanks so much. Yeah, of course. This is Ray checking for sound. We can hear you, Dr. Queen. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I know this is a little bit different timing than we've done in the past, but appreciate everyone's flexibility and making the scheduling work. Uh, this is Ryan from TEA, and we're gonna get started now, and we will start with introductions to the folks in the room from TEA, and then we will call on the folks online to make sure your sound is working and we can hear hear who's online with us. So. I'm going to start with Mark. Uh, hi, this is uh, Mark Olson with the Texas Education Agency. Hi, this is Tam Jones over uh, with Ed Prep. Hi, this is Marilyn Cook with Ed Cert. Hi, this is Yamara Duhar with Testing on Standards. Hi, it's Beth Burkhart. Hi, this is Jessica McLaughlin with Standards and Testing. All right, thanks so much. Um, I'll go ahead and call on people. Uh, I'm just going to read a uh, username, so I appreciate you will need to unmute yourself and say, hey, I appreciate, by the way, as we norm this, uh, if you are kind of uh, listening, it, it's best practice to leave yourself muted, but once you got something to say, don't uh, feel free to unmute yourself and join in. So uh, we'll start just at the top of my list, which is uh, Leslie Cooper. There we go. I knew I could unmute myself. Hi, this is Leslie Cooper. I'm the new coordinator for our EPP here at Region 20. And Jessica, it's great to hear your voice again. Hi, Leslie. It's great to hear yours as well. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Uh, Griselda Garcia. Are you able to unmute or maybe stepped away? Hi there. I'm sorry. I seem to be having some technical difficulties here. Griselda Garcia, Associate Dean for UTRGV College of Education. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, Zach Rosell? Yeah, hey guys. It's Zach Rosell with I Teach Texas. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Ray Queen? I lost it. This is Ray Queen. I'm with Teachworthy. Thanks, Dr. Queen. Uh, DB Cell. This is DB, and I'm at Western Governors University. Thank you. Uh, B. Rawson. This is Brian Rawson at Region 7. 
Thanks, Brian. Um, everybody's moving around in my order here. Uh, Kyle Bordeaux. Pat Lamar. Kyle, do we have you? Right. Well, if you come in, let, do please let us know. Uh, see, this is, I should never volunteer because I'm bad with last names. Uh, Miriam Dombrowski. Mm. No. Uh, my user O Brown. Hmm. Uh, my user Patrice Werner. Hi, Patrice Werner, Texas State University. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Weinbaum. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, Rebecca Weinbaum. Just want to let you know, I invited Kyle Boudreaux from Lamar with me over at Lamar together as we're working on some TEA things. So, um, so he'll probably pop in or out. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, user R. Hampton. Uh, Beth Maylock. User Alexandria Level. Uh, user Joyce Alexander. I can't hear. We, we can hear someone now. Hear them. Why can't I hear them? Uh, please speak up. Is that you, Dr. Alexander? Yeah. Okay. Sounds like uh, Becky Hampton with Region 4 is having a little difficulty with her audio. Um, I've got some phone numbers mm -hmm. as well. A uh, person whose phone number ends with 6169. I don't know. Maybe not there. Person who's at 707-365-0790. Hi, this is Miriam Dombrowski from the Commit Partnership. Hi, Miriam. Thanks for being here. Uh, I got user Tim Miller. Any other users, uh, particularly our folks who are on the EPAC uh, that didn't get to chime in and say hey, uh, feel free to, to unmute and say hey. This is Beth Malik. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Malik. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Um, thanks for that. Oh, I. Uh, I am monitoring the chat, so if you uh, encounter things that you think you should be unmuted and you're muted or what have you, you can go ahead and chime in. Um, but uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. The first thing I want to uh, remind everyone is that the last EPAC meeting, we had discussed how we were going to record these meetings. And so, just wanted to remind everyone of that for our discussions. That way there's full transparency onto the discussions and the information that's sh shared here can be discussed elsewhere. And so just wanted to make sure I reminded everyone of that as we move forward. Um, and we will be posting this.
somewhere. I'm not quite sure where yet, but we'll we'll find a place to post this and make sure this is widely available. So just wanted to start with that. Um, first thing we wanted to spend a little time with, uh, given its importance and given the level of feedback and conversation we've had, is the science of teaching reading transition. This continues to be major focus of our work in energy here and we know in the field. So some of this is going to be repetitive of stuff we've talked about in, in the past and that's that's intentional just to make sure we're consistently communicating and that as new issues or um, challenges on your end have arisen that we can get that and then we can be responsive to that and also just to make sure we're we're sharing. I know there was discussion on the taco listserv and sort of um, the perception that this was all new new information and so we just want to be consistent about communicating around science teaching reading just think this is going to be a major major focus moving forward so um, just wanted to highlight that so quickly um, just going back to the statutory um, charge here um, this is going to be required and so we will not be able to issue certificates after January 1st 2021 um, for anyone for any of the EC6 uh, or four through eight certificates that involve reading uh, that hasn't passed the science of teaching reading exam so just wanted to come back come back to that and hit that uh, this is we've we've shared this pretty consistently since June but just wanted to come back the certificates this applies to are the new EC3 certification, the EC6 core subjects, four through eight core subjects, four through eight English language arts and reading certification, and the four through eight English language arts and social studies certification. So um, the exam cost for this, which will be a constructed response and selected response exam, will be $136 for candidates. So let me just stop right there on sort of baseline information and see if anyone has any questions about that before we move into a little bit more about process and next steps. Uh, this is Beth, um, a UT. I, and may, I think in looking ahead at the slides, you may be getting to this, but we have a question about the, for our students who started in their professional development sequence in January of 2020, no, in, D, in fall of 19, 2019, they will finish their program in December and they'll take all of their exams, but they're unable to take the science of teaching reading exam because that's not offered till January, I believe. Um, and we can't recommend them for certification until after their degree posts, which will be in January of 2021. So then they take their exam. So, so first of all, we haven't adjusted our curriculum yet for this group because we were assuming this would be effective for the, the one that started the following semester. Um, but it puts, there's a timing problem that they're going to take core subjects, but because their degrees don't post till January 2021, then they can't get certified without taking the STR exam, which then delays their certification even more. Is that a question that's discuss later in the slides? It absolutely is something we want to spend a little more time with. We talked about it a little bit last time. We've done a little more homework on our end and we wanted to get a little more input from from the folks online. In particular, uh, this, this largely being a, a higher ed issue, so in particular from our traditional programs on the line. So we will definitely talk a little more about that, but you've done an excellent job of, of framing that conversation and, and, and setting that up. So we need to get a little more understanding and input from this group when we get there um, from what's what's going on and kind of what options are. And then that will help us to sort of go back and explore further on our, our end. So we, we will definitely make sure we, we spend a little time on that. Great, thanks. Um, 
So let so we've made a fairly significant pivot as far as what we are requiring from programs versus what we had discussed um, both at CSOT and the prior EPAC meeting. So I'm going to let Tam talk a little bit about what we're asking programs to do um, to uh, be able to recommend for this new um, certification exam. Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to reference back uh, a December 18th, 2019, big, big mail out that we send um, through, through email. It had seven attachments in there. Uh, a great many of those had to do with upcoming deadlines, line in the sand, and so forth regarding um, uh, the STR requirements and such. One of the items that was in there, and by the way, if any of you did not get that December 18th email, shoot me an email, let me know. I'll be happy to push that out. We've had some people that have said they would like to have received that, and so we're happy, happy to send it your way. Um, the first thing was, that was included in there was this attestation letter. And basically what that says uh, is when we, whenever we receive it from you, and notice it has a deadline uh, mid-December, uh, the end of this year, it says we have updated, not we will, but we have updated our curriculum to incorporate the STR standards. Uh, into our program so that they'll be adequately, you'll have curriculum coverage uh, regarding the SDR standards. Uh, that's, that is really important. Uh, you don't have to rush to do that. This is, it, it says not that you're intending to or that you plan to uh, send us that letter when you've got things up to speed. Um, if we don't receive that letter by the end of December, that will signal to us uh, to start turning off some cert areas uh, that pertain to STR that you don't plan to, to you don't intend to update uh, in order to support candidates. So just keep that on the radar. That that's kind of our way so that we can keep track. Uh, let your let your program specialist know if they've got any particular questions. Uh, we put that it, that date on there just it, it protects candidates from uh, maybe going to a program who at this point uh, at that point in time has not up yet updated their curriculum to reflect those new standards. Uh, let me ask Guillemar to then go into some of the curriculum components for SDR, unless you have any questions. Again, if you didn't receive that December 18th email, uh, any time today or, or first part of next week, shoot me an email. We'll glad to push that out to you. And feel free to chime in or ask questions now if you want to. The one um, thing that we've heard from some programs is that although they're not required to submit that complete application, to us, many of them are still using that as a planning tool to sort of guide some of the curricular changes with their program and, and alignment to ensure um, that those pieces are taken care of. So um, although we are not making you jump through all the hoops, we still feel like there are some valuable tools there that will be helpful in the alignment process and also helpful in informing sort of uh, future program reviews where this is something we will be looking more deeply about at um, coming around the five-year continuing approval reviews in coming years. So I um, think there are some useful resources and tools there, even if you're not having to submit it all. So I'll get out of the way and let EMR take charge. Um, let's, um, let's take a moment to talk about what have you done to start to transform your curriculum to meet the new standards? Um, we know that part of the update of the curriculum has to do with a, a science of teaching reading standard. Um, let's open to some discussion. What have you done to start to transform your curriculum to meet the new standards? Anyone has a comment about that? Well, this is Patrice. Um, I'm, yes, yeah. we, um, we are not having to do a lot of curriculum transformation. Um, these are these are all things that we teach in our reading courses. Um, so um, I'm a little worn out from hearing people talk about how we're not doing any of these things. Um, but this is stuff we've taught for decades um, for the most part. So some tweaks here and there and some moving things uh, around is, um, those are the conversations that we're having. 
Thank you, Patrice, for your feedback. So um, some of the curriculum resources that we have uh, provided are the SCR standards and the SCR framework alignment chart. We also have an additional tool, the SCR and peak alignment chart. Um, and the letters training. You can also always find more information in the HB3 videos. So if you have attended the letters training, could you share if this has been a valuable curriculum resource? Has your update in your curriculum? Anyone has attended the, in your program has attended the letters training? Then um, moving on to testing resources. One thing I, I do want to highlight on the HB3 videos, and then there are some other uh, Reading Academy videos that, that are coming out sort of on a regular basis, a pretty significant amount of resources there. Um, many of those are attend intended for in-service educators, but I think there's a lot of value there for pre-service and for preparation. And so one of the things we've really been working hard to do is to the extent that we could align with reading academies and with that work going forward and sort of what the expectations are going to be in the schools um you know i would encourage y'all to sort of stay tuned to those conversations and you know take advantage of those resources and tools that are being made available there so there were several through the hv3 videos and then there's there are many other resources coming out um specifically related to the science of teaching reading um, for, for schools. So stay tuned, kind of look for that. We'll try to push some of that out, out to y'all on, on an ongoing basis, but just wanted to make sure folks were aware of that. And I, I think I'm very encouraged by what Dr. Werner said. And, you know, a lot of programs have been leading the way on this and, and, and sort of doing this consistently for a long time. But, um, for those who are maybe this is more of a shift for trying to make sure there are resources out there. And Mark has something from the chat. Yeah, so from the chat, we got asked, um, uh, this is user Y Gomez. We have asked in the past, will EPPs have access to Reading Academy content? So the first thing on this is that I, so let me say there's a lot of moving parts on Reading Academies too. And so we're, we're still in close contact there. So I don't have all the answers. The first thing I would say is that a number of EPPs, as I understand it, have applied to be Reading Academies trainers and providers. And so some of them, some on the call or out in the world will be, will be providers that way. Um, we're still trying to work through what, how many seats are available and what opportunities will be available for um, candidates and preparation program faculty and staff to attend those reading academies. So that is one that has kind of been a fluid situation, but but we definitely know that that is, that is a question and we are, as soon as we have an answer on that, we will share that more, more widely. And then also, uh, can you just mention again where the videos that are available that you mentioned? We will, send those out later today, and then we'll also share them with other, other programs, the other non-HB3 videos, but the, the reading, science teaching reading videos, they're, they're through the um, curriculum area at TEA, and so we'll, we'll provide those out. And then, uh, Alexander Level, Dr. Level, I wondered if you could go ahead and, and unmute, if possible, to ask your question, because I, I want to make sure that we got a clarity on it. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Alex Level, UNT. So I'm getting confusing information. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding, so I appreciate it in clarification. I was told by Cherry Lee um, that IHEs were not eligible to offer the Reading Academy's training. And then in the grant that went out on December 5th, um, eligible recipients for that funding were only the Education Service Centers. So I'm a little I, I could use some clarification there, please. I think there's two different things going on there. I think there is there is the grant, there was a grant, but then there was also the opportunity to provide the, the training. 
but um, I wish Cherry was here with us to answer that question, but we'll follow up and try to get, get some clarity on that. Okay, I, thank you. Because we would be interested in supporting that, but my understanding was that we were not eligible to do so. So thanks. So we're very excited about some testing resources that are coming up. We have the SDR test framework that is very useful tool to look at your curriculum and see what you're already addressing and where do you need to um, add more in your curriculum. But we also have the SDR examination manual will be coming out um, later tentative date in August 2020. And in the manual, there will be a example question and with very detailed in, um, description about why one answer is correct and why not, just like the usual. They will also have a constructed response sample and they will have a practice questions for the candidates to complete. The manual will be available electronically in the Pearson website. And once it, the manual is online, we will send that communication to the program. There's also a representative test on, that is an interactive test that will be available for the EPPs to purchase, but that will be available uh, tentatively after January 2021. So next we have the content knowledge and content pedagogy. Um, we offer the letter training um, two sessions, one that was November, December, January and February was the second session. Next week will be the second part of the second session. We have many of the programs that attend and we are considering an additional training in the future for programs that were not able to attend the first session or the second session. And for more information about the letters, training, and upcoming events, if your program was not able to attend, and they will be, and if they're interested in the future letter training, please send me an email. There's a question about online modules. Yes. What about the uh... um, uh, Dr. Malik, do you want to uh, unmute and, and just uh, clarify on your question? I'm just wondering where the online modules are available. Is I, I was thinking that the letters training was only available face to face, but that slide said that there were online modules. Yes, the on the way the registration works is that once you read, uh, they send you a formal registration email and you complete your registration, you attend the in-person training and you have access to the online model. So you receive in the in-person training, you receive um, two books and also you receive a detailed training about the resources and how to um, address the science of teaching reading has your has an instructor and then you have models that have videos questions and reflection and more resources in them that you can complete please okay. if, if you did, if you attend the trainings and you have uh, been been able to access the models please send me an email and we will help you with that okay thanks we had a couple of other people who who attended from our program so i can check with them and following up on Dr. Level's question about providing who can provide the reading academies, yes, the ESCs are maybe providers and there is a grant application available on TEA webpage. There is also an application available for non-ESC applicants. Um, and so I there is there is a link to that from and we'll we'll send all of that out. There is a significant web page around HB3 reading academies. So um, that information is there and we'll, we'll make sure that's, that's available and we will send that out to this group and also disseminate it to the broader group of programs. Thank you. 
So some assessment resources um, will have the test framework that is available in the CEA website, the preparation manual that is tentatively date is August 2020, and it will include sample questions for constructed response and selected response. Some of the questions will have a detailed explanation of why they're the correct answer. Um, we'll explain also the wrong answers, and they have additional practice questions with the key. Um, this is a graphic that we created to help illustrate the changes of the that will be affected with the SCR examination. As you can see in the traditional pathway, uh, students that need to complete their coursework and their uh, clinical experience will take the CPR or HCPA, the content test, and the SCR examination before receiving the standard certification. For alternative certification, uh, students who are starting their internship um, in August 2020, they may take the content test in the fall, but in the spring, they will need to complete taking the PPR or HCPA and the SCR examination in order to receive the standard certification. We're reminding everybody that all the EPP requirements need to be met, the test complete, the fingerprint, and any fee <coughs> before December 30th, so you can recommend the sports certification on December, before December 30th, so they can be issued on December 31st, because after January 1st, unfortunately, if you recommend after January 1st, the students will be required to take the SCR examination. And so I think this really is getting to Dr. Malik's uh, question, concern, and some questions um, that, that we've had last time. We have tried to go back and look at some data around what happens to December graduates around the state. And so we have a number of institutions that have December graduates who are recommended for certification within a few days after their graduation and have their certificates issue in December. We have some who don't. What we don't have insight into is Maybe they graduated, but they hadn't completed some other programmatic requirement, and that's why they were not issued, or if it has to do with the registrar's office and when the degrees post, and that some registrar's offices post the degrees sooner than others. And so we, we don't have much insight into that, but it seems like just going back to the most, you know, two months ago, there were a number of people who graduated in December of 19 and who received had their certificates issued in December of 19. So it seems like that is a feasible thing in some places, but maybe not everywhere. And so I think uh, it would be helpful for us to understand what this limitation is because we don't have really have much room to maneuver with our statutory deadline on that. So we don't have a lot of, um, flexibility to offer there on our end. We, we looked at systems things and we looked at other things, but that statutory deadline is a pretty, pretty firm deadline for us. And so I would be curious to hear from folks online about this. Dr. Warner. Dr. Warner. Yeah, um, so we've been, uh, I spoke up about this at our last EPAC meeting and had a huge concern about it because our it's just the usual way of doing business that our grades aren't actually posted until January for December graduates. But we've just been exploring options with the registrar's office and also our advising center. Our advisors are the ones who actually, you know, because you have to wait until um, finals and grades post, which is about a week, maybe a week sometimes after um, the actual ceremony occurs, right? Because uh, students ta are taking finals right up until that time usually. So once grades post, then our advisors have to kind of comb through transcripts to certify that yes, this person has met all of the um, requirements so of course, in larger institutions, 
this is just much more time consuming, but our folks are very, very efficient and they get it done before Christmas. But then we have the Christmas break. And so it's not always feasible for the registrar to even in a situation like this to be able to um, get all the diplomas posted and, and so forth. So, because some of it depends on the academic calendar, which was set years ago, that kind of thing. It's a very complicated situation. So we're exploring the possibilities with our registrar to see if it might be possible uh, because we, and then our own staff then has to um, then go in and do all of the certification and recommendation. So that's a lot of moving parts that have to occur. And in our case, for a lot of uh, December graduates. So I just, I wanted to kind of lay that, our process out. And so we're, we're not completely freaked out. We're thinking it's possible. Um, we have some indications it's possible, but we've got to work out all the logistics. Um, if, if not, you know, we're gonna have several hundred students who um, are kind of stuck with this um, big change and having to take an additional test. Um, and we get, I totally get that this was a legislative thing. It's very clear in the statute, this deadline is hard and fast and we can't do anything about that. So we got to, we're, tr we're trying to do best we can to make it work for these particular students. That's what I, that's what I'll. Thank, thanks for walking through that, that context. Is anyone else who, uh, from the higher ed perspective in particular, having these conversations or um, had any insight into kind of how to, how to make this work uh, locally? Yeah, we basically, this is Alex Level from UNT. We have the same problems that Patrice is talking about, you know, size of the program. You know, we're a little bit, I'm glad, it's nice to hear you have a great relationship with your registrar. I mean, we can prioritize the groups of students, you know, that would, after the deadline, have to take the STR, you know, and our certification officer can process those first, but we're, we really are kind of at the mercy of when the degrees get posted. I mean, you, you said the date was firm. I mean, even for us, if it was January 15th, then there wouldn't be a problem. Everything would be posted, done, and that would give us time, you know, considering the winter break uh, to get everybody, you know, every, everyone's um, uh, files in order and get them sent off and, you know, recommend them for certification. So two weeks would be, would solve UNT's problem. I, this is Beth. Um, I've already um, expressed our problem, <laughs> but, uh, and I, I, we could try to work with our registrar. I don't have a lot of hope uh, for that, but um, I may, I just made a note uh, that we should try to reach out and see what the possibilities are. Um, but even pushing it back a few weeks, like Alex said, would, would help. Us. The problem is when the degrees get posted, obviously, um, but I don't know that you have uh, any wiggle room on that date because of the statute. Yeah, I think that's, that is, we've tried to explore this from every angle on our end. We, we just, we, we don't see any wiggle room on that um, from, from where, from where we sit. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a this is the quickest you know we've had some transitions and i will tell you we are still on a daily basis dealing with the transition issues from the principal um change over and where we had people who had graduated had completed all certification requirements had tested and passed had applied for certification but the programs just didn't recommend them so i mean we had people like that that we're hearing from on a daily daily basis and so and that was that was a much smaller universe than we're, we're talking about here with with sort of ec6 and 48 
population. So I think we we are very sensitive to this, and um, I think as y'all become aware of things that we could do to be helpful, um, we're happy to try to help on our end in process and communication. But I think the the thing that we don't have any way to be helpful with is the deadline, Mark. And I would just chime in that you know. Uh, we greatly it's great that we have you know this space with this group and i would just encourage you all uh to have those conversations with other uh folks at other programs uh in the field who may not be in this space because uh you know uh we definitely have innovative etps uh, in this state and folks as you're figuring out uh how you can make this happen uh within your institutional context learning from each other uh, and, and being able to, you know, find the, the right line of communication, all those pieces, uh, we, we, you know, it is, we, we recognize that it is uh, February already, but uh, we do hope that as uh, programs, uh, as, as you all are able to identify things that work for you in your context, uh, please do share, uh, not only with, uh, with, with your colleagues that are part of this group, but your colleagues that are part of the larger group. Um, because, you know, as Ryan said, we're, we're pinned in by statute on this. And so uh, the y'all being the great problem solvers that you are uh, uh, and leaning into those strong institutional connections that you have, uh, please do. And, and to the extent that you can let us know and we can, you know, help when, when programs come to us and say, you know, what are other people doing? Uh, if you've squared this circle, we can uh, let us know so that we can uh, point them in your direction as well. So after January 1st, 2021, the traditional route for the students to receive their standard certification will be the content test with the SCR examination, then the PPR or SCPA for alternative certifications, the content test with the SCR examination to receive the intern certificate, then the PPR and the or SCPA to receive their standard certification. Um, so uh, what we see up here, sorry, this is all this is Mark. Uh, so we were thinking through some transition issues and some some use cases, and we uh, I've been in IT too long to say use case. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, thinking about some of the you know some some of the cases, some of the descriptions, and so these are the, some of the things we looked at at the last meeting. We've tried to further flesh these out. So the first situation is the candidate, kind of what we've been, uh, well, no, a little bit different. Candidate who graduates in mid-December 2020, but that didn't apply for their cert prior to the deadline of 12-30-2020. So they didn't go in and apply for their cert. So here, you know, we encourage you all to discuss with all of your candidates about this deadline. It's not a deadline that they can blow off or ignore. Um, we also encourage you to, uh, you know, archive email notifications create standard emails uh, that you're sending out and you're making sure that uh, that you're capturing that you done these communications. And we, of course, are happy uh, if you would find use in it to provide template communications. And if there are candidates that you don't have an email for that you would like their ECOS email for, um, if you think that might have utility, please do reach out to us and that's something we can run down for you. One of the things we suspect is there are going to be a flood of candidates who have maybe graduated and completed all program requirements within the last few years preceding this but never went through the process of applying for certification and so that's another population y'all are going to be having to contend with and we are too so this december graduates are sort of clear and present but then there's this other group that over the previous five years maybe had had for whatever reason, not applied for certification. And I think that's true of traditional and, you know, potentially alternative certification programs. Absolutely, and uh, and we'll see that. Um, the the second piece I think we talked about uh, a little bit here already. That my I'm an ETP in my administrative offices. They don't post the degrees till after January 1st. So that's what we're encouraging y'all. Uh, please do work with your administrative offices and the, your registrars, your folks who. Uh, who need to be click a box uh, 
and we're of course happy to provide any information to folks that if, if you can find if there's utility in that for you um, we can provide you with graphics and statutory citations if you need to go and uh, escalate an issue to anybody we we can provide you you know we got your back on that um, the third piece I'm a candidate who won't complete all my requirements till after 1-1-2021 and so those are, as we saw on that slide, if those requirements aren't done until after then, uh, they will need to take the STR exam. And so uh, uh, we know y'all will work with your candidates to, uh, you know, uh, work and help prepare them for those exams. And uh, we just pointed to some of the support materials uh, that we're uh, making available to y'all in order to support uh, your work there. Um, as we're thinking about these, so just to preview, the next slide is about alternative certification programs, but as we're thinking about supports for traditional programs, are there other supports from us that y'all would I, uh, could identify as being, being helpful that we could look into? Well, as those emerge, as you, you know, go back and, and talk with your, uh, you know, with your colleagues about that, please do let us know if there are, if, if there's something that you're like, you know, if TEA would just send us an official letter with, under TEA letterhead, and that would help to, to move some things along, please just let us know. Um, our next slide here is uh, thinking about transition issues for alternative certification programs. So, I'm starting my internship in January 2021. If my intern cert is not recommended by December 2020, then I won't be able to get an intern cert uh, without taking the STR. So um, we would encourage uh, folks who are in this situation to, to, if you can, recommend those intern certificates prior to 12-30-2020. Um, again, uh, keep your, uh, we encourage you to keep track of any email uh, notification that you send to programs related to that. And, and similarly, we can provide y'all with uh, template communications, uh, candidate lists, email addresses, and the same. Uh, and then finally, folks who started their internship prior to the requirement and then have finished after the requirement, now as we saw in that prior graphic and, and aligned with statute, they'll need to take the SDR. So, uh, Again, I, we encourage you all as, as prep programs to uh, provide candidates with, the, with supports uh, as they pursue passing that STR. And, and we, uh, you know, we can provide you all with uh, uh, information, standards, frameworks, and the rest uh, about the STR. Any other thinking specifically through the lens of alternative programs? Are there additional supports uh, that could be helpful? So I just say it again, as you have these conversations in your, uh, you know, within your program, across programs, please do, uh, if you're identifying additional things that you need from TEA, if you're identifying additional open questions that you have, like, well, I think it might be this, but it's not clear to us, please reach out to us. We want to, uh, it's really, we, we recognize it's important for us uh, to be able to communicate uh, a, a whole lot about this. And so as those things come up, please do let us know. We would prefer to answer the question as it arises. And, and I know y'all have been asking about reading academies and we have been asking as well. So we're not, we're not neglecting you on those. It's just kind of playing out in, in real time on that front, but we'll provide some additional resources. Does anyone have anything else on science teaching reading before we transition to the next topic? And before transition, I would say, uh, Dr. Garcia, I did see your comment related to uh, information that we may provide to you to share uh, when you're discussing with registrars. Uh, we're, of course, happy to, to, uh, put, to share some stuff that we have. And uh, I would also encourage if uh, other folks on the call, if you have anything that, you know, standard uh, that you're using, um, please do uh, go ahead and share with each other. And I, I did have one more question. Uh, if someone's first day with students will be 1-5-2021, one, 
and they're uh, going to be on an intern search. Can a program recommend them for that intern search before 12 30 2020? So uh, their first day with students is 1-5-2021. So I think it's a, a question of the, the timing, when you're allowed to recommend an intern shirt, shirt in relation to when their first time they see students. We, so I, I'm looking at Tam in the room. This is Marilyn. So from a certificate issuance perspective, um, I don't think that there is anything that is going to prevent that from happening because when the certificate issues, it's going to be effective for that assignment based on the date you're beginning. I, I say that with just a tad bit of hesitation, so I'm looking at TAM to go based on what has been the standard recommendation for programs. Um, I don't know if he feels differently about that. No, I, I don't. That, that's accurate. I was just looking at what is it? Slide. See the number. I was looking at slide. Slide number 14. I was just going back to look. Says so this would be after 1/1/2021 1, 1, and where that would fall, and they would just have had to have to have taken those uh, the testing meet met the testing requirements uh, for that. I don't think there's anything that's going to hold them up. They would just have to pick up. They just have to pick up meet the testing requirements prior to. Let us take that back and make mm -hmm. sure we're not missing something on it. But that is a very fair question, and we'll try to be make sure we have a more definitive answer. We're mm -hmm. writing it in pencil <laughs> lead right now, but it it seems seems like that should be okay. Yeah, but let us let us research that a little, mm -hmm. little further. Mm -hmm. Right. With this graph. We will we will circle back on that. Is there anything else on STR? Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, in other words, would the STR be required of such a candidate? So, uh, Roy, that's what uh, we're 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 sorting out here. If if the cert doesn't issue till after. If the cert doesn't issue till after 1231-2020, yes, even if it's an intern cert, you need the STR. So starting 1-1-2021, one, one, uh, probationary cert, intern cert, standard cert needs STR. And that's what slide 14 is talking yeah. about, the word intern certification is just left off. All right, changing gears to a less controversial and complicated topic, we're going to talk about EdCPA briefly. All right, hey everyone, this is Beth Burkhart. Um, going to provide you with the most exciting slide in this deck so far. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, so EdCPA pilot uh, year one is just rolling around or rolling along. We got uh, most of our programs getting ready to submit uh, or have their candidates submit portfolios pretty soon. For the year two pilot, uh, we've selected three regional coordinators. That was through a competitive LOI process. Uh, these three folks are going to be able to provide on-the-ground support for all the programs who are participating in the second year of the pilot. So we're really excited about that. Um, and then as far as next year, we just had the, the final deadline was last week for um, all of the EdCPA pilot applications for year two. Uh, so we are in the process right now of reviewing those and we will announce uh, any of the participants coming up in a week next uh, Friday. Any questions on EdCPA pilot? All right, thank you. All right, now we will move and hit some highlights for the February SBEC. Oh, oh. oh we got a TPA question. Uh, the question is support grant status? 
support grant, those are also being reviewed. So there were two ways to apply this year. One was through the support grant LOI process and the other was through a process similar to last year's application. All of them are going to be announced on February 14th. So we are set to review all those and have them ready by next Friday. Anybody else on that TPA? All right, very good, thank you. All right, now moving to uh, the, uh, well, the, the slide says December SVEC meeting, but it's February SVEC meeting. Um, the next slide says this, uh, so that's, that's my bad. Um, so hitting first the adoption item, for item five, chapter two, thirty. Um, Marilyn, have we had, I know this is not your item, but we've had some public comments on that. So we've just gotten those in and sent to us. And so we are reviewing those now. Um, this is the item that deals with the retake date, changing those from 45 days to 30 days. Um, it adds the science of teaching reading to the figure in various places and it deals with creating the new assessments for early childhood pre-K through three and trade and industrial in addition to um, adding language around the ESL supplemental for the intensive pre-service. Um, this chapter also has the educational aid language around allowing high school students to earn the educational aid credential after completing CTE and um, has the language around the certification corrections and, and what happens there. So um, I don't recall a lot of testimony on this one and I don't know what the public, te the public comments are, are looking like yet. So I can't say if there will be any changes, but I don't, I believe the item that you have in the board book that Katie sent you is 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 the same as you saw before. And so um, anything anyone would like to discuss on these particular 230 changes? And this is an adoption item. Uh, so I'll go ahead and uh, item A will have the uh, ASEP statuses, the accreditation statuses, uh, up for the SVEC to approve. Uh, just a high level summary here, uh, the 76 EPPs uh, accredited and then 26 on warrant and 26 on probation based on our, uh, based on the 1819 data. I would say that uh, we had, um, uh, I don't remember if it was 11 or 13 informal reviews that uh, came in by our deadline that we were able to process and work through. Um, and so uh, these are the uh, statuses that we'll be bringing forward to the board uh, at the meeting. Um, very exciting for us uh, at this meeting is we're gonna be able to also bring forward the slate of EPP commendations. So uh, the past year, the SBEC uh, approved a framework for uh, commendations for EPPs uh, four-part framework there, and we're excited that uh, based on 1819 data, we are able to recognize uh, a number of EPPs in the different uh, categories and then individual measures that were approved by the SBEC. Uh, so in so doing, uh, we'll see uh, 15 different EPPs recognized for uh, first test pass rate uh, above 95%. Um, and then also uh, a subset of EPPs recognized for uh, pass rates in uh, very high pass rate in teacher shortage areas. Uh, and then there's uh, three different categories of preparing the, the educator protective needs, including uh, preparing teachers in shortage areas, uh, preparing uh, teachers who are identified as teachers of color, and preparing teachers who go on to work in rural schools. And those are all looked at as a, uh, as a percentage of the educators that are, pre that are uh, prepared by the program. And then finally, uh, a few retention and employment measures. Uh, retention uh, as a teacher for five years, uh, retention within the public school profession, uh, within public education. And then finally, uh, programs, uh, one particularly for our educator prep or for our principal preparation programs, 
uh, identifying programs that are able to, that, that their uh, folks that they certify with a principal certification, that they're working as an assistant principal or a principal within three years, the percentage of those folks. So um, we're excited to get to uh, recognize uh, programs based on that framework. Any questions related to ASAP statuses or commendations? All right, we'll move to item 15, which is for, I don't know, our record setting third meeting in a row or fourth meeting in a row. I think third meeting in a row where 228 is, is a discussion item. There continue to be um, little tweaks and conversations along the line that have kept this from sort of being ready for, for prime time movement as a proposal, but we're hoping the third time's a charm and that this will be a proposal moving forward in May, but I'll turn it into Tam to kind of talk about what's here and what has been changed since the last time. Thanks, Ryan. Very good. Um, what we have for you are the big eight areas that um, we're up for are up for discussion. Let me say that there's no, the only change in items is in number two, uh, where we've can, where we've uh, simplified the language, and we won't, we'll look at that in just a moment on a separate slide. Um, and in number eight, which is new, um, and this may be worth, uh, this may have been worth to the programs waiting and letting it, let this item stay in discussion for yet one more meeting. So if we go to the, if we go to the next slide, this has to do with number eight, and since it's new, we, we wanted to look at it first. This, the, the genesis for this slide has come a great deal out of what has surfaced from the 068 uh, to 268 transition. And it is something that we've already had some uh, stakeholder input on, and we wanted, just, we wanted to just take a minute and park it for a moment on this slide so that we could get a chance to, to talk to you um, about where the, what we were trying to do. What surfaced in 068 as it was coming to a close and has really come up uh, later on, uh, and as Ryan said, it's, it's surfaces daily. There are situations where people were, had completed and finished their program, uh, but, and this is, we're talking 2003, 2009. Uh, I know the programs by name that have called me, uh, and we've kind of worked through some of these. Um, and so the question comes up, what do we do about granting test approval on someone and it typically comes up in two areas, and this is what this is the language that we've got folded in, uh, where someone has been gone so long that the standards of the test has changed since the candidate completed uh, their program in that in that in, in a particular area, or the candidate has returned for test approval five or more years after, and that, this is more the, the situation that we're getting, where they show up five or more years following, and we have said that if it's in the same principal class, even though the test has changed from 068 to 268, the candidate has to be allowed to give and t be given test approval. And I think everyone understands uh, what the, how the standards radically changed from 068 to 268. And as a result, the programs were starting to feel a, a real concern over giving test approval when the standards are so radically different. And then in the first bullet, the test has changed as well. And the reason why we, we put five, it wasn't arbitrary, is because five, after five years, um, if a candidate hasn't finished the program, then, then the coursework becomes obsolete at that point and doesn't count towards certification. So we're trying to stay in line with that. And we wanted to just park it here for a minute and just give you a chance to look at this so that what this would do is give you the ability to be able to sit down with a candidate or either one of these two scenarios happen, either one of these two situations, and allow you, before you give test approval, to work with them to be able to, on additional coursework or training, to be able to have them show test readiness for the current uh, standards and test um, or if, it, or if they're returning and it's been a good while since they finished your the, since they finished your program, so let me pause on that for a minute, and then uh, see what kind of feedback you have on this.
Let me ask it this way. Is this a good thing or, or do we not need to have this in there? Ray Queen says it's a good thing. Could, could I, would, could I, would, would I be so bold as to ask you to, to kind of elaborate just a tad? Why, why would it be a good thing? Sometimes, hi Tam, sometimes we have candidates that um, we, we get on, you know, we stay on them, we can show an email trail where we have tried to encourage them to finish up and take their tests and and they don't. I mean, you sometimes you know you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And so I think this just would provide some um, some kind of protections from these candidates who surface, you know, six years or so later, and and demand to test when it's been that long. Okay. Anyone else? What? Thank you, Ray. Anyone else want to weigh? Would like to weigh in on this? It is discussion, and this was our first crack at at some language that seemed to address what we had, what we had been hearing, and to try to be a little more proactive on this, because it happened with principal, but we know that's nowhere near the volume of what's about to come with all of the all of the certs that are related to reading, leading into STR. So I'll pause for just a minute. Thank, I, Ray, I appreciate that feedback. Anyone else want to chime in? All right, let's go then to the next slide. You know how to contact us if you've got any, if you've got other thoughts on this. Um, then if we go to the advance to the next slide, this is this is the other item. Out of those eight blocks, those eight big areas, these are the only two that represent any changes. And I want to highlight for you uh, what we, the difference between the December 6th meeting and what we have before you now. In December 6th, we tried to, we had three different parts under 20, uh, 22815 under uh, lowercase a um, in three, four, and five. And all of them had an August 31st closure date. And we kept, we kept wondering, well, why do we need to keep parse and parceling out uh, whether they can't complete the program, uh, uh, whether we're going to recommend them for an intern or probationary, uh, three different things, but everyone seemed, everything seemed to land on August 31. So what we did, we collapsed this into a little bit simpler language that just simply says, the program shall not admit candidates or recommend candidates uh, for an intern or pro, or, or pro certificate within one year of the August 31st closure date. Again, we're having programs that for whatever reason uh, are closing and we have heard, as if you have listened to the uh, SPEC meetings, the, the board is, is, is very plugged into how are we able to make sure that candidates are not falling in a gap and what supports what does the program offer uh, to help them so that they have every opportunity to finish what are, what are state staff doing in terms of working with the programs. So what we wanted to do was try to provide something that, uh, that is very simple and very straightforward. So again, just like on the other item uh, on the box number eight, comments, feedback. How can we best protect candidates when programs are closing. Remember, what we're trying to do is programs have announced that they're closing. We're trying to get them to shift away from recruiting and admitting and shift over to finishing out or teaching out the current students that can finish by August 31st or help them segue and transition over. So what other, is there any other additional input that we should include, anything to clarify, further elaborate? Uh, again, uh, less is more. So that's really what we've tried to do to make this as concise as we can be. I think we would just encourage programs to look at this language, um, you know, see if there's anything else 
there that gives you any concern. I think the board's emphasis on this has really been doing what we can to protect candidates and as more and more programs close or consolidate mid-year, the more candidates we sort of have stuck in limbo. So we're trying to ensure we do what we can. And I think this is a, a protection for programs that aren't closing and are kind of sticking around as, as well as the candidates. So just want to make sure this is on everyone's radar screen as we try to try to make improvements here for those, those candidates stuck in the middle. The next item we have is item 16, uh, which is uh, our educator standards item. Um, so there is a lot happening here and there's um, largely it's the same as it relates to bilingual and special education is what you saw before. We've, we've tweaked the language. We've made sure everything is consistent on special education around um, early childhood through sixth grade and sixth through 12th grade there and so we've gone through that that language and so if you'll recall when we first started the the initial recommendations that came out of the uh, task force on special education were recommending a four-tiered special education model and so after further work this is looking at a a two two-tiered grade banded model for special education certification so this reflects those standards uh, bilingual, that, that language is, is largely consistent last time. Guillermo, were there any changes to bilingual since last time? No. Okay. So that should be the same as what you had seen at the, at the previous meeting. Uh, the stuff that's going to look very different, but really isn't all that different is as it relates to science of teaching and reading. And so with House Bill 3's passage, um, it, we needed to make it clear that science of teaching and reading standards apply um, to those EC6 course subjects and the appropriate four through eight certifications. So that's been restructured and move around, moved around a little bit to reflect that. And then there was one addition uh, relate, within the reading pedagogy section of the science teaching reading standards that was, was also aligned with hb 3s language. So I don't know Yamar, Beth, anything y'all would add on this? No, it was that um, we decided that if SCR, it would be more meaningful if the standards were living by themselves instead of attached to EC3. So they could be more meaningful and it will be clear how do they align with the HB3. And as Ryan was saying, the only addition to the pedagogy section, it was to continue or same terminology and clear message about explicit instruction and systematic uh, instruction, which it was, it is part of the science of teaching reading pedagogy. This, these will, you know, I inform the basis of um, our test development cycle moving forward, and so it's it's always a long way from standards to a test test rolling out, but um, this next item sort of speaks to what's on the calendar as far as test development and what's coming up. I think the changes I would highlight that have sort of moved into the to be determined category are health and physical education as ones that we thought would be ready a little sooner, but we are needing to align with the TEKS coming out of the State Board of Education. And so as their processes have continued to play out, we've needed to press pause just a little bit on test development. So I still think those tests will be moving forward sooner rather than later, but until they get the, until the State Board of Education completes the TEKS development process on that, um, we, we had to press pause on our, our work there. But the others should largely be, be consistent with what you've seen previously. Um, this is something that EPAC has asked us for several meetings ago, and we just wanted to make sure we were bringing back to you as far as rule making timelines, as far as discussion proposal and adoption. And we have a question. Uh, Dr. Werner, uh, I wonder if uh, you could uh, uh, unmute and, and shine in there. Just, I uh, yeah, the on from the last slide, I couldn't type fast enough and somewhere in the middle in that my computer just restarted 
um, when we were uh, talking about the tests and stuff. So I missed some things. Uh, so on the list on for January 2021, we have early childhood grade six course subjects. Um, and I was just wondering if that was, there had been talk that uh, some of the reading content would be pulled out of core subjects uh, because um, STR. Um, so I just wanted some clarification on that. And then I guess a side question that I've never thought to ask before is, is there any chance that the cost of core subjects would be slightly reduced? Uh, because some of that content is coming out and is taken care of in STR. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I understand both of your questions. So um, let me speak at a high level as to the content. So yes, there is some STR content that would have been duplicative on the EC6 core subjects test that is, that is coming out of that. So there is still going to be a an English language arts and reading uh, component of that test, but some of that content is coming out. And so consequently, the, the, the timing around the test and sort of across each domain, there's gonna be some slight um, adjustments there to number of items and time allotted per section. I know that's something we've, we've heard a lot about. So stay tuned on that. We are working through that right now and we'll more have more to update um before too long on that so we're just trying to get make sure we understand options and get things in place there so the structure of that test will look a little different and that's that's why you see that it it will have a different number as well um, and we'll we'll keep you posted on that but i think um the the upshot of that is that candidates are going to have more time for for the various sections on on this test um, your second question about cost, the cost of the exam is, is set in the contract and that, that will not change. Um, so. But good question, fair question. Um, here's our upcoming rulemaking schedule just so everyone has that and we did send send the deck out to you. So you have this for sort of planning and this is always sort of subject to change at the board's direction or as, as things things cause us to need to slow down. Um, rarely do we speed up, but from time to time we, we, we have to slow down, but this is our best guess at what, what schedule will be on with various rule chapters for coming SBEC meetings. All right. And we did have one question come in from Dr. Queen as a requested item for the EPAC agenda. And we can go ahead and go to the slide and we can let, let Dr. Queen, let me give you a moment with this if you're following along and then maybe let Dr. Queen uh, raise her question. All right, Dr. Queen, you've asked about allowing a third test attempt for accountability purposes instead of just the current two attest as constructed. So um, anything around that before we, we sort of um, try to speak to that a little more? No, I just, I just kind of wanted to bring it back up because I know those numbers were presented um, to the board in December. I think when you look at um some of that information and some of the demographic information i i would have concerns as to why some demographic groups are not testing at a second attempt or a third attempt and so um i feel like if we want to encourage as many teachers of color to enter into the profession 
that I don't want the barrier to be there of programs um, that they may feel um, some pressure at this two-time test accountability. And if you look at the history of where that came from, um, there was a great discussion when that two-time test accountability was set and the board said, go back and, and look at it and set it somewhere between two and five. They were totally fine with that. And it came back at the next meeting at two. So I, I think we have some flexibility knowing um, the history and looking at some of this data. Um, I, I just, I, I'm curious to know, I, I feel like it was presented. I, I was grateful that it was presented, that we looked at it, but did everyone just sit there and scratch their heads and say, wow, what do we do? I mean, what are we doing with this? I think it's very telling data. So let us, so that data, first, thanks for raising this. That data is a little misleading because it is the full population of all routes around testing. So it's not limited to those in a certification program. It includes out-of-state testers, certification by exam, patch testing, every other route a person, and doesn't actually reflect the data that is used in accountability. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and let Mark pull up a little bit around the actual accountability data since the accountability is really raised as the concern. As as Mark's doing that, we can we can definitely a few of us have been here for a while and lived mm -hmm. through the last time we we discussed that so we can talk history too but i'm going to let mark um, sort of share the accountability data and this this tool is available on the website for anyone who wants to look at it and see what the actual accountability pass rate data is just so we're apples to apples comparison thanks for that right and and dr queen again thank you for raising this um i think if uh, it's important, of course, for us to be able to make sure that we're clear with uh, the board in particular what it is that they're looking at. As you know, uh, particularly as a member of the data working group that got to uh, work on drafting the manual, doing all that work, that what goes into your ASAP accountability pass rate is not every test. It is uh, It has to be those tests that are recommended by the Ed Prep program that align with either the internship cert. Or, uh, or with what the program says that they're pursuing. And of course, it's the first attempt if they pass it, or it's the second attempt if they pass it or they fail it. So, you know, I, I know that it was great to, to see all those, uh, those data that were in that board item, but I think that, because uh, we've had some questions about this, you know, as you know, but it's particularly been coming to us uh, through an EPP accountability lens. And I just think it's real important for us to clarify what it looks like for each for for the ASEC calculations. So what I've done here uh, on the screen is I just pulled up that dashboard. And what we're doing there is we're showing uh, the the um, we're showing the ASEC pass rate, uh, which you know I know that shorthand it's easy for us to say first two attempts, but again that's not quite what it is, right? Because there's some additional hoops we have to jump through on that. So I just pulled that up, and and unlike the uh, the all test. Uh, first and second pass rate that you might have seen when we look at the whole universe of tests. When we look at the ASAP test, we do see there's a pass rate of 92%, uh, which is well over a standard of 75%. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and select some demographic groups. So it's actually uh, both the female and the male groups uh, stay at 92%, which is well north of the 75%. Uh, we can go in and we can select individual demographic groups. Uh, sort by race, ethnicity. So I've got the candidates to identify as black or African American here. Now this is, of course, still though statewide, but this is at 83%, uh, which remains, you know, well north of that uh, of that 75% uh, standard. Uh, here's our candidates to identify as Hispanic or Latino uh, at 88%, and our candidates to identify as white at 95%. One other thing I would like to just uh, kind of flag here. Is we can look we can look at the individual exams as well. So some exams that you know uh, may be thought of as uh, particularly difficult. So our, our chemistry exam is sitting at 95 percent. Uh, uh, there's the uh, the computer science exam uh, that's at 100 percent because actually not a lot of computer science candidates meet the requirements for ASAP, right? 
Um, many of them are cert by exam. Uh, we can look at, uh, we can go down and look at physics. Uh, I always look at like, uh, physical science. Here we're at uh, 94%. Um, so I would just encourage you to, um, you know, when you're thinking about the accountability piece, and what are our pass rates for accountability and where might uh, EPTs be doing these types of calculations related to accountability. I just encourage you to, um, to, to make sure we're, we're looking at the, the numbers for accountability. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and, and, and toss it back over. Uh, uh, I think Christy has some stuff to share. Oh, well, yeah. Christy always has some stuff to share because I've been one of the ones that's been around for 99 years. Um, so, Dr. Queen, I'm not sure if you're requesting that staff go back and recommend a three-time test. Um, I've, I've been spending some time going back and looking at how the board landed on the, the two-time test um, attempt. And I know that initially it was going to be first time um, because what the board was able to look at is what it cost candidates and why there should be such a disparaging cost for candidates to pass tests for certain programs and, you know, have to pay less if they go to other programs. Um, we were able to look at there not being a true differentiation between uh, programs for accountability purposes, which is why this has put in statute for consumer and for policymakers. Um, you know, and going back to students in, in public ed are accountable for the first time. So um, I thought the board was being very uh, generous when they went to the two time pass rate. But if this is something that you all want to convince enough of the board members to revisit, we're, we're happy to bring up the history and, and bring this back um, as a discussion. And I'd uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Roy Herther, uh, UT Permian Mason, you had uh, something you'd like to, to share, love to talk through? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, just hearing he doesn't have a mic. So uh, uh, from Roy out there, a uh, third attempt, uh, essentially the, the comment is about remediation. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, just word for word here, a third attempt before accountability would encourage remediation. Currently, if remediation is done after first attempt, candidate fails again, and remediation is revised based on feedback from uh, the prior remediation, there is no accountability reward for the EPP for doing progressive remediation. There are other rewards, of course, but an accountability reward would be nice. I mean, I, I guess we've kind of got the, the open discussion. We, of course, wanted to just uh, um, share our thinking on that. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Queen, as you, you, you brought it forward, just uh, we're happy to hold the space. So I do expect us to be having conversations about 229 and sort of some questions around 229 uh, discussions in May and sort of so between the February meeting and, and May, more discussions about a lot of things related to 229. And so that, there will certainly be opportunities to raise this. I think as is the case in any system of accountability, wherever you draw a line, there are going to be people on the other side of that that line. Um, what we have not yet seen this be a major cause of failure in the ASEP system as it's currently constructed. So Mark sort of showed the overall statewide average data, but as we look at this at a program level and look at the ASEP 
impacts um, for this being an indicator. There aren't a ton of, of programs getting hit um, on this and sort of having a lowered status as a result of this. There are some, um, but you would expect to see that if you're differentiating among programs. Um, I think our concern is what we've heard some rumblings about of programs letting candidates take a test one time and then exiting that candidate out. And so I think that's a very concerning practice. And, you know, I, this is akin to what used to happen on the K-12 side with accountability of schools pushing kids, pushing kids out who couldn't pass the test. And then we had to add an indicator around dropout rates. And that is how that had to be addressed on the K-12 accountability side because there was a perception that certain students couldn't achieve at a at the requisite level on the test. And so um, we'd hate to see that playing out here and want to make sure there are the right incentives for um, appropriate instruction in the first place and then remediation after the first attempt. Um, but I, you know, certainly room to continue discussing discussing this and recognizing that the burden for subsequent tests does fall on the candidates. Mm -hmm. So. Is there anything else SPEC related, EPAC related that anyone would like to raise for further discussion while we're all here together? All right, so we've got our we've got our date um, on that prior slide there. There you go. Um, so sort of what these are our anticipated dates. We are in uh, anticipating at least the July meeting being an in-person EPAC meeting. We found that it's a little easier for people to get get here in the summer. Um, no, it's always hard to get here and have moved this this way. But wanted to make sure folks had those dates for planning purposes. When can we expect to learn more about HB 2424? When can we expect to learn more about HB 2424? So we are awaiting some direction from folks across the street. And when I cross the street, I mean capital sort of folks, as well as from the, the commissioner's office on that. And as we have more to share, um, we will share it. Um, that bill had a had language in it that said TEA and SBEC didn't have to implement it unless funding was provided for it. Funding was not provided for it. So we are working through that across all the funding priorities of the agency and things that are sort of outside our our control. But but as as we have updates on that, we will definitely be reaching out to a wide array of, of stakeholders to see what that looks like moving forward. Anything else, folks, uh, feel free to unmute, chime in, or uh, anything on the chat? All right. Well, thank you all for your time. We will be posting this. Um, we will be sending out the additional information about the uh, science teaching reading and some of the resources that are available there and that will include um, and and I have no idea what the application timelines were to be a provider but they they were there so we'll be sending that out and a clarification on the intern certification question I we we think we're getting close to an answer on that but we want to make sure we run traps on that so we will follow up on that but Thank you all so much for your time. And if anything comes up as you dig in to the agenda between now and the board meeting, please feel free to reach out. We're we're happy to happy to help and lean in. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks,